Welcome back to Beyond the Uniform. I'm Justin Asiri, and each week I interview military veterans about their civilian career. Today's episode number 76 with Liz McLean. They rush into it. I think that's an issue. I think they worry so much about all the changes that they, they don't pause and really think about uh, what the next step is. Now, not everybody has the luxury of preparing for six months. Sometimes they are medically discharged or there are other extraneous circumstances that make their transition come upon them much quicker. But a number of times I see people try to just rush into a role without looking at the, the broad picture. The top three reasons to listen to today's show are number one, transition advice. Liz has worked as a recruiter for top companies, including Booz Allen Hamilton and Hewlett Packard. Each of us only makes a transition from the military once, but Liz has worked with hundreds of veterans in their transition. Her advice on this is really worthwhile. Number two, recruiting. A career path that not a lot of veterans consider is being a recruiter. Liz talks about what it's like and how you can succeed in this career path. Number three, starting a company. Liz chose to start her own recruiting company rather than join an established one. She's got some great advice for vets thinking of starting their own organization. As always, at beyondtheuniform.io, you'll find show notes with links to every resource we discuss, as well as timestamps to the different points in our conversation. So let's dive in to my interview with Liz McLean. Joining me today in San Francisco is Liz McLean. Liz, welcome to Beyond the Uniform. Hi, thank you so much. Happy to be here. So quick background for listeners. Liz is the Senior Program Director of of Veteran Employment at Military.com, as well as the owner and president of Liz McLean Veteran Solutions. She started out at the Air Force Academy, where she served for five years as a logistics readiness officer. Since 2010, she's worked as a recruiter for civilians and veterans with multiple companies, including positions at Booz Allen Hamilton and Hewlett Packard, where she worked to refine veterans programs. Liz, Liz holds a bachelor's in behavioral science and a master's of science in industrial organizational psychology, where she focused on the people versus the product for program efficiency. Her passions are fueled by ultra running and up to the Ironman distance triathlon. So Liz, to start out, I always like to ask, um, at what point you knew you were going to leave the Air Force and how you approached that decision? Sure, that's an excellent question. And to be honest, I think that is something that I, I help people to answer and figure out as they're navigating their own transition on a, on a very regular basis. For me, as I was nearing my exit, I, I knew I had a a couple o- options. Realistically, I could I could go back to school, and one of my thoughts was to obtain my PhD and come back in as a psychologist. At that point in time, my husband and I were high fiving in the door on deployments and trips, so it was it was getting a little hectic in the in the home front household. Um, and so I started to realize that truly, um, if I wanted to make the impact that I wanted and still be able to somewhat balance my my home life, uh, I wanted to move into the HR se- uh, section. So for me, uh, I you know it started to get a little bit closer, and I saw the opportunity to exit, um, put in my paperwork, and quickly contacted a, a close by recruiter to talk to them about how I could get into the HR space to help veterans you know, as soon as possible. That's great. And um, I'm wondering, you know, what, what you learned in that first job search and in your time since then that you'd want to, uh, to share with veterans about advice on their, their first job search out of the military. Yeah, sure. It's it's difficult. I mean, there's there's no question about it that it is a challenge. It doesn't matter if you've been in for five years, 10 years, 20 years, getting ready to retire. Uh, the, the point is that you can make a difference. You do have an opportunity to go into truly any role that you desire. People get so scared thinking that just because they served in logistics or just because they served in a requisite job code, AFSC, MOS, et cetera, that they have to do that in the outside. The answer is that you can truly go into any role that you desire as long as you break it down and look at some of your subjective traits as well as as your objective traits. One of my favorite stories is a gentleman that was getting ready to retire and he, he really couldn't figure out. He had been in aircraft maintenance for a majority of his career into into staff roles and 
he felt like that's what he had to be a part of. When we broke it down and asked him, you know, what are some of the things you like to do on the outside? He said, you know, I really enjoy teaching yoga. Now, as funny as that is, um, that's how we were able to get him into a human resources role by figuring out that he loved helping people. So for me, a little bit of the story that I don't tell and you probably won't see on my resume is the fact that when I started getting out, everyone targeted me for logistics. They said, hey, you've been in logistics. This is what you have to do. This is where you need to go. And I suddenly found myself in the logistics pipeline because that's that's what I needed to do, regardless of the fact that I knew deep down in my heart I wanted to be HR. So my first stint was actually in a logistics role for a period of time. And I always say I never have quit anything in my life. And I actually left that position to move into the veteran recruiting. So for me, um, I always relate to people, you know, hey, it's okay if A, your first job isn't exactly what you wanted or intended it to be. And B, do not let anybody tell you that you can only do what your job code in the military said that you did. You're a jack of all trades. And like I tend to say, a fire and forget weapon, which means you can be put into a position and you will get the job accomplished. You know how to get it done and you know how to work hard and diligent. Yeah, that's great. I mean, that's definitely a big motivation for me with this show is is to showcase for veterans, you can do anything there, whatever possible career you can think of, there is some other veteran who is succeeding there. And what I admire about your story, especially putting myself in your shoes when you're getting out, there's so much, there must have been so much pressure and so much instinct to take those jobs to say, okay, I, I'm used to having done logistics. And so that's going to be the path of least resistance. I'll I'll just do that. And it takes a lot of courage to say no and to go without that offer for a little bit until you find what's right. And it, it seems like the further away from um, the very immediate next step outside of the military, you, you know, that, that the further away you get from that, the more effort it takes to, to, to figure out what that is and how to get there. But I really admire that you were willing to set your own course rather than just take what was easy and what was being handed to you. Well, thank you. I mean, I, I won't lie that that first veteran recruiting stint was a hundred percent commission. So I definitely took a leap of faith. Uh, to try to make sure that I got myself down that path. And that's not the case for everybody. But yeah, you're exactly right. It's, it's a daunting, it's a daunting time for people when they're getting ready to exit so many different things from thinking about medical benefits to, you know, what do I want to be when I grow up again? (laughs) <laughs> one more time. How, how was that like? I mean, that is, that is, you know, there's so many sales roles and um, I'm imagining recruiting roles that are highly commission based. And it sounds like your first one was 100% quota based. I'm wondering, um, do you have any advice for a veteran who's, who's accepting a role that is going to be heavily or entirely commission based? And especially like how long you think it takes to, for, for, you know, on average to be able to start making money? Because I think of like how much saving someone would need to build up to be able to survive that period. Oh, that's such a great question. And I'll be honest, I tend to tell people not to do that as their first stint out, just because sometimes it's good. Even if you have your nest egg, you don't know what kind of industry you're really getting into. Um, I think that in hindsight, you know, maybe taking something where I was able to put together, I mean, I had saved well, but a a little bit more of a a nest egg specifically for that job before starting it would have been, you know, set me up a little bit better if I were in, in someone else's shoes. There are a number of positions out there that are, 100% commission or heavily commission based, as you mentioned, that come out of the the major pipelines for uh, recruiting firms. Um, I'm not going to name any specifically, but when those come down and are offered to service members, um, they seem really appealing because you have a lot of autonomy. You can work from home. You can travel and, and, you know, it's, it's exciting to, to have that, that mission of success, but the downside is sometimes you can work as hard as you possibly can and end up 
still without bringing any funds in because you cannot guarantee that that, that on people that you know the mission is going to be a success. And that is also an attribute of super smokers. Again, is that those fire and forget weapons, sometimes it's hard to turn it off. I won't lie. That first gig for me, I could not stop. You become almost obsessive because you are trained to succeed and trained to make sure that you accomplish what you can, but you always want to improve and and do better, which means you can always do more in commission based. So to answer your question, I would say if you are interested in taking a role such as that, really evaluate the company itself, its track record, its history. Take time to talk to some employees that have been there for a while and look at their success rates. If they have hired other military members as well, take a look to see what their success rates have been uh, in particular, because you know, you might find that the longevity there is a turnover rate of, of 18 months, which is a pretty common turnover rate these days. Or you might find that most of them stay for the long haul because there are other incentives in place. So it really depends on where you're getting ready to go. Personal Liz McQueen feeling is probably maybe wait a little bit before diving into that if it's your first gig and they do not also give you a little bit of a a monthly compensation package to offset even even things like your gas or your telephone bill. Yeah, I think that's such great advice because there's so much risk inherent in taking a new position and a new industry and a new functional role and a new geography. And that's that's probably typically the military route where all of those are very, very new. And then to introduce the volatility of not even having a guaranteed paycheck, it's so hard to evaluate how long it will take to perform and, and, and get there. And so I think that's that's very sound advice. Um, and and I would love to learn more about your current role at military.com and in particular, what your day-to-day life and activities look like. Sure. Great question. So I will tell you that military.com actually has been, you can consider them my, my client uh, for the past year and a, a half. And I'll be converting to you into a full-time position there, you know, with still my own company offset on the side here in the the next month or or so. I started out with military.com helping them with some large-scale planning for Fleet Week, uh, using a lot of my connections and a lot of my logistics planning, tapping into that background to help them to orchestrate an event. And from there, it turned into helping to build out a veteran employment strategy. So uh, military.com has, you know, the world's largest membership organization. You're looking at 10 million members strong, which is extraordinary. So the pulse point and the touch and the reach out is, you know, uncomparable to other organizations that you might see around the U.S. or the globe. So it was really exciting to feel as though I had the opportunity to work on veteran appointment initiatives for something as robust and esteemed as military.com. So Moreover, specifically, my role has been to help build out those efforts to help work in more of a business development arena to help bring the employers and bring the veterans together into one common place. If people are to navigate our website, you can see that we are a very credible news source. So everyone's homework out there is to go ahead and join military.com so you get those those daily newsletters, which are the most up-to-date info you could imagine with quite the the barrette that is truly very helpful. But besides that, other areas, you know, including veteran employment, including uh, our new transition app, the desktop version, which is super exciting to me. This is something I am traveling around talking to you in tablet classes and part of the Chamber of Commerce's fellowship programs, which is an application for service members getting ready to get out that you can use to navigate day by day, week by week for up to 18 months as you're getting ready to get out. So that's something that Citibank has helped to sponsor and we are really um, out there talking about because we're really proud of it. So majority of my role is really spreading the word, a lot of, you know, ambassadorship and a lot of helping to be the voice of the veteran and get them ready and prepared uh, for the transition with those employers that we feel truly value um, what these these service members can bring to the table. 
That, that leads really well into my next question, because I'm just wondering, with so much experience in recruiting now and in your current role, what are some common mistakes that you see veterans making in that transition, in the job search, and in landing the, the first couple jobs out of the military? Sure. They rush into it. I think that's an issue. I think they worry so much about all the changes that they, they don't pause and really think about uh, what the next step is. Now, not everybody has the luxury of preparing for six months. Sometimes they are medically discharged or there are other extraneous circumstances that make their transition come upon them much quicker. But a number of times I see people try to just rush into a role without looking at the, the broad picture. Um, it's difficult when you are a service member and you see that there are upwards of 50,000 plus nonprofit organizations out there trying to help. Instead of making it streamlined and helpful, it becomes noisy and really complicated. And it's hard to figure out who to go to, where to go to. So many people want to help. It's so amazing. But gosh, look, I just found myself in this sea of quote, help, end quote, um, companies, and I still don't know what to do. So my advice is to not necessarily start out applying for a role, but to really think about what you want to do and start with networking. I think networking is the number one most efficient tool out there, communicating, looking at the type of organizations that truly match your moral compass, your values, your skill sets, and reaching out to actual people and say, hey, this is what I've been doing this is what I want to do. Do you have some advice on how I can get there? And it is never too early to start talking to people. It's never too early to start going to networking events or, or talking about those things with other people because that's what's going to help you to get your foot in the door when you are ready. The next step would be, hopefully, that person in the organization will pass you on to an a HR rep or a recruiter And you can see about open positions. I can tell you I've never actually applied to a role for a position for myself. I have always obtained my role by reaching out. I ended up at Booz Allen Hamilton from the recruiting role I was in because I reached out to Booz Allen Hamilton trying to recruit them as a company to hire. uh, And they came back to me a while later and said, how would you like to work with us? Same with, you know, CACI and actually the same with Hewlett Packard as well. So taking the time to really just dissect who you are as a person and what you value or what you think you value at that point in time in the long run. And then just start talking to people. Don't be shy. I th- I think that's great. I mean, I think that a recurring theme in these interviews is the importance of networking and just lots and lots of action, getting to know lots of different people and how serendipity leads to a lot of opportunities And I also agree on that piece on self-knowledge of just really um, getting a clear picture of what you want. And and like you said, finding companies that align with your values and interests. And I'm wondering, because self-knowledge comes up so frequently on these interviews, I'm wondering, do you know of any good resources, be it a book or website or program, that you would recommend to a veteran that might help them uncover more about their personal motivations or what's a good fit for them or what, what really matters to them? Yeah. I mean, that's a really good question. Uh, I actually think if you go to military.com and you run some searches there, you will find a plethora of articles that are out there regarding just that. So that's one avenue. One of my favorite books is also Joe Sweeney's Moving the Needle, which talks about how to network properly. And it, it, it goes a little in depth saying, you know, you should reach out to five different people and, you know, you spread your network that way. And it talks about breaking down those, those skill sets. Um, another one of my, my favorite books is actually called uh, Eater, Leaders Eat Last. And it talks a lot about leadership and those traits um, and how you might be able to dissect those into um, into roles that might in, you know be exciting to you in the near future. Uh, there are a number of resources that help you to kind of you know look at your subjective traits, look at your objective traits, and figure that figure that out. 
Uh, we have a great skills translator that you can find also on some company websites and you can find on our site as well that will help you break down more of the areas that you might go into based off of your your field with some other subjective input. Um, but then it's also on you and your own onus to, to do some research. So top recommendation would truly be head to military.com, not just because I work there, but it's because where I went as well. And to type in, um, type in leadership, type in uh, next steps, type in transition. We have an entire transition center that talks just about that. So, yeah. Um, and, and Joe Sweeney's Moving the Needle is, is quite excellent. And um, for listeners in the show notes at beyondtheuniform.io, I'll, I'll add links to military.com, the skills translator, and all the, the books that um, Liz recommended. I'm also wondering for someone listening who might be interested in following in your footsteps and taking on a role as, um, as a recruiter, as a starting point, what would you want them to know about the day-to-day life and activities and maybe even indications that that might be a good or a poor fit for them personality-wise? Sure. You know what's so funny is people never think about recruiting. In fact, when I go out and I teach, um, the fellowships are a good example on base, I talk about what the different roles are in the HR hiring process. So if you look at a more robust program, you have sourcers, you have recruiters, you have human resource business partners, hiring managers, all of that. Now, a sourcer is someone that's out there typically just gathering resumes. They're the people that are sourcing the peop- other people, which hand off to a recruiter. Now, a recruiter is basically like a, a salesperson for people versus a product. So the way to figure out if that's something you're interested in, granted some people come from a recruiting background in the military already, is to figure out if you enjoy truly talking to people. How comfortable are you on the phone? How comfortable are you really looking at resumes, helping to dissect what someone has done and and matching it and match them to a role that is open. For me, my definition of success for myself is helping people. Getting into human resources immediately after your exit is difficult with you unless you want to start in a recruiting field because you typically don't have the training in HR to go directly into a higher level role than that. So as you're nearing your exit, if you are thinking that you want to do something that involves helping people, that involves talking to people, but isn't necessarily social work. I often joke that I wanted to be a social worker, only paid a little bit better, that was dedicated to the military, and that's how I ended up in <laughs> HR. You know, then start looking at, <laughs> it's true, like, and then start looking um, at those companies that might have recruiting positions available. Sometimes you have to take a pay cut. It doesn't have to be 100% commission, but you have to take a pay cut to start there. And that's okay, because you can look at what the trajectory is to, to build yourself back up. But if you are interested in, in getting into the human resources arena, interested in becoming a uh, recruiter, I would shadow someone. I am happy to talk to people about the day in the life, but I would reach out. A few people are going to say, hey, I don't want to be your mentor. You know, I would say reach out to someone that you find is a recruiter in the company and say, hey, would you mind talking to me a little bit about what you're doing day to day? You know, how many phone calls are you making? How hard is it to try to find a certain skill set in a sea of people? And do you find it rewarding? I found it incredibly rewarding to be able to call someone and say, hey, guess what? The hiring manager loved you you were getting a job, especially when it comes to dealing in the military space. You have someone crying on the other end because they're about to start the next chapter of their life. So look for a mentor, talk to people and really dig deep down to see if, you know, you're willing to be on the phone all the time and, um, you know, help people to define their own, define their own next chapter. One, one thing I wanted to, uh ask as well is what's what is the most challenging part of your job as as you look back on your time since the air force what's what has been the most difficult thing that you've had to do in your in your in your roles yeah 
That's a great question. So I'm not recruiting any longer. Um, but when I was in, in involved in the higher HR process, letting people go, telling people I'm really sorry that we're going to be going through some significant cuts and, you know, effective two weeks, you are no longer going to have a position. I'm an extremely empathetic person, sometimes to a fault. And it doesn't matter if I'm telling one person or if I'm telling hundreds of people on the phone that that never gets easier um, knowing that you're you're having to close a door for someone. So I found that to be emotionally challenging and, you know, hard as I didn't necessarily compartmentalize it as, as maybe as well as I should at the time. Um, and another piece that I found hard is when you're in recruiting, sometimes you end up doing some of the more IT techie type stuff, which can be really challenging and you're dealing cross-culturally. So that was a challenge for me, um, not just doing veterans, but having to find military that had different IT certs and, and different um background dealing with computers, et cetera, it becomes really precise and almost scientific. So I had to dig deep and really do a lot of research to get efficient on that. And and I'm assuming that in this in you know when you were first starting out that well actually am I am I correct in assuming because I, I wanted to learn more about starting your own company and, and starting to dig into that but is that is that kind of a prerequisite if you're going to go this route that you start by starting your own company and then um, branch out from there or is that one of of several possibilities? Oh, one of several possibilities. So for me, I had worked in corporate, you know, for at three different companies before I decided to start my own company. The reason I started my own company was because as I was building out these programs, so many people across the country were asking me, you know, how do you create proper programs? What's the best way to do this? And where do you think this veteran would make the best fit? And am I doing this right or wrong? And I realized at that point in time that there was not another person out there consulting on these initiatives. And I thought the market was right. So I made the jump to do it. Um, and that, you know, helped me to gain notoriety. It took a lot of long hours and dedicated networking to be able to grow uh, my company and be able to have those consistent contracts. And it was those reach outs that connected me back to military.com. You do not have to start your own business to get into recruiting. I, when I was doing recruiting, I, um, you know, it wasn't my own business. Now I did have some contracts that were recruiting while I had my own company. And a lot of that was because I wanted to still be a part of that process, stay efficient and that kind of gave me my financial padding, to be honest, to have the ability to reach out to those other companies. But no, by no means do you have to start your own organization to be able to get into the recruiting HR spe spectrum. Every single organization, enterprise or small, medium business, SMB, has some type of recruiting function. What do you What do you think are kind of the pros and cons of, of, of each route? Because I can imagine... Um, I can imagine if you join an established company, it's a little bit more secure. But do you have any thoughts on the, the pros and cons of joining an established company versus striking out on your own and establishing your own practice? Yeah, I mean, I, I do. I think the pros to going into an established company are that you have stability, more or less. You know, if you're concerned about benefits, you have that set up. You have a knock on wood guaranteed paycheck um, and you're not always looking to ensure you have an ex contract and that you're keeping things going so that, you know, you, um, y you know, you do have a guaranteed paycheck coming upwards. Um, you know, within an organized company, you also, you know, you have a set boss, so you don't have as much autonomy typically. Now, conversely, when you are out on your own, each of your clients you really could think of as your boss because you need to do exactly what they say in order to get the job done and to keep your your paycheck. The outside, you have a lot of autonomy, you know, not working in the corporate confines. You have autonomy. You can, you know, police your own hours. You don't fear the mediocrity aspect. You have, there's more of a meritocracy in that sense. And the, you, the world is, 
your oyster. You can continue to build on it and not feel as though you are ever being stifled. The only limitations are the amount of effort that you put in. But for me, for instance, um, I sometimes don't know how to shut off. So that can be also, an, you know, more of an, an issue. So really taking a look to see like, hey, what are your boundaries? Personal boundaries are big and professional boundaries are big. Um, do you, what is the market that you're going into? Is it saturated already? Are there other people doing what you're doing? Um, and how long are you going to be able to keep this, keep this going? Um, you can always keep your business going on the side while you work in a full-time capacity as well and come back to it later, which is, you know, kind of where I am at this point. Very proud to be a part of military.com and plan on forging ahead full force and effort. Um, but my organization is there. It's still, you know, it's still named. It's still in the background, depending what personal endeavors come my way. That's awesome. I mean, it sounds like that's the the best of both worlds where you're able to kind of ha maintain that. Um, having spent so much effort getting it up and running, it's easier, I imagine, to maintain and keep it going and kind of keep it as a, a creative pursuit. And then I imagine it's it's also an option that you can you can hop around in the future and and invest more or invest less time in that. Um, and and I was really interested in hearing about advice for other veterans who are looking to start their own company. Um, I can imagine, especially in those early days of um, establishing these relationships with extremely well-known companies and, and just how difficult that must have been to get your first client and all of these different things. Um, what would you say to someone who's thinking of starting their own company in, in any field? Yeah, I mean, networking, it goes back to that again, really reaching out and getting yourself known uh, to be a credible resource. Like you want to be that trusted advisor. People want to believe in you before they are going to hire you and don't expect to necessarily get the big fish straight away. Now, some people in, in, in their own organizations have, you know, angels or VCs that, you know, provide some backing. I, I did not do it that route. Um, but if you're looking for that, you know, starting to navigate those waters and think about who might be a good investor for you. But the most important thing is really just credibility. Um, you know, I had to build my resume, had to build my credibility, had to build rapport with people before they were willing to trust me and know that the education I was providing them was realistic and would be effective. So write everything down, keep your files, keep your Rolodex robust, and do not um, think for a minute that uh, – that stopping to to talk to people is going to halt your process. Always make always make time to to talk to people because you never know how it's going to end up helping you in the future. Mm, I think that's great advice. Um, I, I always also, also like to ask about mistakes because I think it's really important for listeners to, to realize that, you know, any career is just fraught with mistakes and that's where we learn so much. That's where so much of our ultimate success comes from is from our mistakes and what we take away from them. And, and as you look back on the time since you left the Air Force, what's, what's one of the bigger mistakes that you've made and, and what did you learn from that and take away from it? You know, I think I went so broad, so fast, because I wanted to make sure I had every opportunity that I, I then overwhelmed myself and I became out of balance. I was working way too much. And for me, with fitness being so important in my family, trying to do that and take care of my father and maintain a household was just not realistic because you, you, when you first break off, you don't ever want to say no. So if you spread yourself to the point where you're out there and suddenly everybody comes back and you don't want to say no, you don't have much time for yourself. And if you really want to do a quality job, which if you're going into this avenue, you want to do, um, you need to be patient and make sure that the contracts or whom you're going to be working with um, are all done in a really effective and um, 
and well-organized manner. So just don't spread yourself too thin, too fast. Be organized and deliberate. That's great. Um, and it worked out for me. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was going to say it worked out in the end and, and all that, but at the same time, I, in hindsight, you yeah. know, writing down those goals. Yeah, yeah. Um, what about, I, I always like to learn about what habits from the military you've tried to maintain that have helped you in your civilian career and also any habits that you felt like you needed to break that, that didn't work as well on the civilian side as it did in the military? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question as well. Uh, discipline for sure. Work ethic. I am obsessive over my routine. Now some people you know, can say that's good or bad, but for me, I, I really find it important to keep myself routine because it keeps me motivated, keeps me efficient. And that includes my athletics. That includes my day-to-day planning. That includes what time I wake up. That is something through the service that I kept. And that for me fuels me to stay the same efficient and, you know, what I hope to be considered as, you know, successful person that I am. So, you know, really looking at what the in-state goal is and making sure I achieve that. I think one thing I, I really found important in the, the service was the concept, you know, take care of your people and the rest will take care of yourself. Um, so I firmly believe that if you're good to people and you treat people well and you trust in what they have to offer, that your mission, you know, will get accomplished. You're going to have some bumps and bruises maybe, but by and large, I, I think that's a good a good method to follow. People, and I will say, you know, hiring managers and companies think that military think only in black and white, and they don't have the the gray. Now, I always laugh and, you know, counter that to say, when's the last time someone had a recipe on what to do when things kicked off in Haiti? We just know how to figure it out as service members. That's something else I've taken with me, um, you know, just being able to figure it out. Now, something that I probably have had to uh, tame down or get used to in the the corporate time founds is, you know, no different working underneath a a boss or a different structure, but you can't always assume that everybody understands what one mission is in an organization. Corporate doesn't necessarily run the same and doesn't necessarily have, you know, the same big picture. The DOD is the world's largest organization and I always say, you think that's complicated. Try working on in the inertia of, you know, Hewlett Packard back in the, the day. <laughs> it's it's more complex, and you you can't assume everybody has. Yeah, you can't assume everybody has the same in state goal in mind. So you have to pause, and you really have to um, halt halt yourself um, from going too fast without explaining to people. The final thing I'll say is feedback. So I, in the service, I was a big fan of 360 degree feedback. I want to know how I was doing from those above. I wanted to know how I was doing from those below. When I moved into corporate, I kind of struggled because I felt like I wasn't getting feedback. I always wanted to know, how am I doing? How am I doing? How am I doing? Like, am I doing well? I don't want to just be doing well. I want to be doing great. I want to make sure I'm meeting all expectations and exceeding them. And corporate doesn't necessarily always follow that same method. Sometimes they, sometimes they do. Sometimes you have your consistent check-ins and other times you just kind of have to figure out whether or not you are doing well. Um, And that took some getting used to for me because, you know, if you all of a sudden got some negative feedback and no one had been telling you how you were doing all along, you know, it can take, it can be a little bit of a, an ego gut check if you, if you will. So uh, when I do teach organizations how to set up proper programs, that's something I tell them. I say, you know, I learned that my expectation was I get feedback and I didn't necessarily. And if you want to maintain your military members and have better retention rates, I would recommend you giving them some somewhat consistent idea of where they, they stand in the pecking order. And I always like to ask about um, what surprised you in your transition to civilian life. And I'm I'm wondering, when you went from the Air Force to civilian life, is there anything you didn't 
know to expect or something that was very surprising in that transition you would want listeners to know about? Sure. The grass was always greener, guys. <laughs> um, it, it, it's funny because, you know, you're you're there and then you're like, yes, I'm, I'm finally ready, you know, to get out. I'm making this change. And I feel like to be transparent, you're in the, the service and there is this concept of you never can get promoted above the next person, no matter how hard you work because of the, you know, how the, the promotions and everything. And I'm going to get on the outside and I'm going to charge hard. And I am going to fly to the top. Well, unfortunately, it doesn't always work that way in corporate either. Sometimes you can work as hard as possible and you still might not always make it to the top. And you can feel a little bit defeated. Um, And you can also start missing that camaraderie. You know, don't expect that the corporate world is necessarily going to have the same camaraderie and work ethic as a service because you start to miss it. So there are pluses and, 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 you know, minuses. Yeah. You have more freedom. You will have more autonomy than the military, but if it's something you've been really accustomed to, you might also end up missing it at the end of the day. In hindsight, I do wish maybe I stayed in the reserves, you know, more to capacity because it would have given me a little bit of that, that structure that I crave that I just place into my, my own life. So not to deter anybody from, you know, getting out voluntarily because sometimes, you know, it is the best choice for you, but just don't have these expectations that you necessarily are going to have the the same camaraderie. You're probably going to have to look for some outside organizations to supplement that for you. Mm, That's great advice. Um, Liz, I always, I always give room at the end to just make it more open-ended. And I, I wanted to, especially in this case, provide, a little extra time at the end, mainly because, um, you know, the, your early career in recruiting is a field I'm just not very familiar with. And then your current position as senior program director at military.com is, is one that I'm not as familiar with. So I, I know that there's a lot, you know, I've, I've asked a lot of questions, but I know that there's a lot that you, that you must know that I just, <laughs> I don't even know to ask about. And so I'd love to just kind of give you the floor to talk about whatever you think would be helpful for veterans and helpful for people listening um, as they think about navigating their civilian career and um, yeah, anything related to their their job search or succeeding in their their career. Anything that you've learned from from your your background? Sure. You know, I would say two two things. Don't be scared. And be humble yet confident. You know, at the end of the day, you will be okay if you're getting ready to get out. You know, it's okay to take the charge. It's okay to step into the unknown. Um, But you do need to have a sense of humility about yourself uh, while remaining confident. And what I mean by that is confident in your abilities, confident in the background that you've come from, but still humble enough to recognize the fact that you don't know everything. I think I teach uh, or have in the past anyway to to veterans more often than not the concept of just because you led 300 people in the Marine Corps does not mean that you necessarily automatically deserve to be the CEO of a company. And, you know, it's funny you have people that get out and carry that chip on their shoulder. And, you know, there's, again, a difference between confidence and arrogance. So really setting your standards to realize, hey, I I come from a great background. I've done a lot, but I always have more that I can learn. If you have that attitude and you are open-minded, you are going to go so much further than if you keep your focus only on what you've done in the past. I say don't be scared because when you're scared, you also don't seem to see tend to see the bigger picture. Uh, that's one thing with military.com and traveling around and, and talking to people I see, I see a great deal. I'm really scared to get out. I really am not sure what to do. I think military.com does a really fantastic job of helping people set up for that transition and providing tools and services that can get them one t- step closer to, to, their, to their dream job, to where they want to be. So utilizing what is out there, use that transition app, use the resources that are provided to you. And don't wait to the end if you can avoid it. As far as recruiting goes, um, 
a little piece of advice I'd say is when someone reaches out to talk to you, treat it as an interview. If someone is calling you from a company, even if you don't think that's necessarily why you, where you want to go, I promise you it's a small world after all. So treat that person with respect and always be prepared. Be prepared to talk about what you've done, have a good understanding of where you've come from and you know where you ultimately hope uh, you want to go. But also don't be scared to tell them, you know, I'm not entirely sure, but I do know I want to go into a position where I can do X, Y, and Z. So um, last thing I would recommend is, you know, I'm a, I'm a big advocate of, you know, using fitness to help individuals as they're struggling through their endeavors, be it PTSD or just, you know, looking for a sense of camaraderie and, this is, you know, a plug just to say, don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, as you're getting out and ready to transition, you know, we see the unemployment rate is a lot better than it was in the past, you know. However, that being said, it can always be better. Um, you know, there's always things we can do better. And a number of times we see the unemployment rate um, be affiliated with people that are afraid to ask for help for things that might have happened to them from their time overseas or, you know, poor reintegration process. So if you're listening and you're getting ready to make that transition, or maybe you already have, and, and you're struggling a little bit internally with yourself, don't be afraid to ask for help because there are so many people out there ready, willing, and and happy to help if, if you are proactive in that. Uh, best phrase is you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. So we want to help, uh, you know, do yourself a, a favor and, and reach out when you can. Really well put, and, and I definitely echo that. And I think that's on things small to things that are big, where I, I just think that the name of the game for advancement is to see, like you talked about, finding mentors and reaching out and getting advice and you know, being able to learn from the experience of others. And it just really accelerates your growth if you're able to take experience from those who have been working for, for longer. And then, you know, in other things as well, like like um, getting help and, and finding that support and finding the connection, because it is a very big shift for most veterans. I would say for probably all veterans, when they leave and they don't have that built-in community any longer, it's a very, very big shift shift. So anticipate that and be willing to ask for help and be open to help. I think it'll make a big difference in, um, in that transition experience. Um, well, agree more. well, Liz, I appreciate your time on this. I appreciate your sharing your story and, and sharing your advice. And I think you just bring a, a wealth of experience. You know, m- most people go through, um, uh, uh, you know, a few job searches in their career and in the first few years out of the Air Force, you know, you had so much experience seeing different people go through this. And so you really bring a wealth from that perspective. And then it's great to hear about life at military.com. And um, as it's a great resource for listeners uh, to, to, to be able to learn from articles and different resources there as well. So thank you for sharing both of those. Oh, you're, you're absolutely, absolutely welcome. And I, I think last thing I'd like to say besides being honored and, and humbled to to be on with you is, you know, military.com is actually run by Greg Smith, who's a retired two-star Navy admiral. So there's something to be said by an organization that's led by someone that comes from the service himself and truly has been in the shoes of people that have transitioned and have made that next step. So I'm a firm believer in, in going to credible, trusted sources and Um, Yeah, I'm proud to be there and proud to be on your show. So thanks again. Surface, surface, surface. Thanks for listening. As we wrap up, I wanted to share three quick but important announcements. First of all, if you haven't already, please sign up for my newsletter at beyondtheuniform.io. Although I publish on LinkedIn and Facebook, I'll be starting to use the newsletter as my primary means to share new articles, episodes, and resources relevant to the veteran community. Second, I would love to hear from you. Sometimes I feel like I'm in a relationship where I do all of the talking. You can view me as your very own dedicated resource to help you and other veterans in your civilian career. 
Have feedback on what I can do differently? Let me know. Someone in particular you want me to track down for an interview? I'm all ears. Know of another way that I could help the veteran community? I'm dying to know. You can find me on LinkedIn, comment on any post at beyondtheuniform.io, email me at justin at beyondtheuniform.io, or if you're in the intel industry, I'm sure you can track me down in some super creepy way. However you do it, take me up on it. I thrive on feedback. Lastly, a quick plug for a few resources I think would benefit any veteran. American Corporate Partners and Service to School both provide free assistance to any veteran. American Corporate Partners pairs you with a mentor in your desired industry, and Service to Schools finds a mentor at a suitable undergrad or graduate school program to help you with your application. Check them out. As always, tons of great content and resources available at beyondtheuniform.io. I'm Justin Nasiri, and I'll be back soon with more great episodes.